You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. A few words from what I might say is one of the more obscure epistles of the New Testament. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It's a difficult little epistle, really, written to a very small ecclesia in the middle of the first century AD. Yet it's supremely relevant to the 21st century ecclesia of our day. Well, you might say to me, well, sure, but that ought to be true of every epistle of the New Testament. Well, and there's, of course, some truth to that, but not quite like this. Because, you see, when you come to Colossians, there's a peculiar relevance to us as a brotherhood. Uh, My first point in regard to that would be contained in verse 27, which we've only just read of chapter 1. It says there, You to whom Christ would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Verse 15 of this chapter says that Christ is the image of the invisible God. So when verse 27 says that the hope of glory is Christ in us, it obviously means the same as God in us, since Christ is the image of God. Well, in a nutshell, that's the doctrine of God manifestation, isn't it? Colossians 1 verses 15 and 27 combined as the doctrine of God manifestation, that God's character might be developed or exhibited in human beings. You remember Brother Thomas's famous words from 1885, men were not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. God manifestation, not human salvation, was the great purpose of the eternal spirit. And so that doctrine, above all others, being the doctrine that separates us from the churches about us, is contained right here in Colossians chapter 1. So it's relevant to us. In chapter 2, verse 1, he goes on and he says, I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So evidently, from chapter 2, Paul had never been to Colossae. He didn't found this ecclesia. They most likely existed as a consequence of his preaching activities in Ephesus, but he's never been there. And he's never been here either. Your ecclesia, my ecclesia, he's never been to any of the ecclesias of the 21st century. Yet, we exist in large part as a consequence of his preaching activities. And finally, and perhaps most powerfully, the opening words of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. I'm listening to the chairman make his opening remarks. I'm thinking, stop. He's stealing my points. Of course, the phrase brethren in Christ is Adelphos in Christos. It's the, it's the very phrase that Brother Thomas used when he named us, as we've just heard from someone else in the American Civil War. Uh, I would add, however, that this is the only time in the New Testament this particular phrase occurs, brethren in Christ. So here's a letter from Paul to the faithful Christadelphians in Colossae 2,000 years ago. So if there was ever a letter to the Christadelphians of the 21st century, this would have to be it, wouldn't you think? We're named in the second verse of the first chapter. We've never seen his face in the flesh, And the key doctrine that separates us from all the churches about us is contained in verse 27 of this chapter. You might have seen me scribbling a few notes as the reading was uh, going by because since the chairman stole one of my first three points, I thought I'd make another point from this phrase, brethren in Christ. You notice it says brethren in Christ. The Greek, as our chairman said, was 
uh, um, Christos in Adelphos in Christos, sorry. It says brethren in Christ. It doesn't say brethren of Christ. And I'd make this simple point from that observation. You know, we sometimes hear the Lord Jesus Christ referred to as our elder brother. And perhaps the reason people suggest that is because words like Hebrews 2 verse 11, he's not ashamed to call them brethren or not ashamed to call us brethren. I'd make the point, however, that it's one thing for Christ to call us brethren. It's another thing for us to call him our brother. He's the son of God. He's a great king. We're brethren in Christ. We're not brethren of Christ. And I think it's, a, it's a, simply a point worth bearing in mind. Well, of all the cities of the Roman Empire, which had an ecclesia that Paul wrote to, Colossae was perhaps the least significant. 500 years earlier, Herodotus tells us that Xerxes, that is the Ahasuerus of Esther, Xerxes stopped there on the way to the Battle of Thermopylae in 481 BC. Colossae, you see, straddled the great east-west trading route that linked Ephesus in the west with the Euphrates in the east. But when Rome took the area in about 133 BC, they rerouted, the Romans rerouted that highway through Laodicea. So, of course, the fortunes of Colossae began to decline. By the end of the first century, it's not clear that there even was an ecclesia still at Colossae. You recall when John wrote the letters to the seven ecclesias in Revelation chapter 1, the letter went to Laodicea, a neighbouring ecclesia, and not to Colossae. Colossians is regarded as one of the prison epistles of the Apostle Paul. That is to say, he wrote this epistle when he was in prison in Acts chapter 28 in about the year 60 AD. That was his first imprisonment. And we say that, that is we say it's a prison epistle because of verses like this. Come across to chapter 4. In chapter 4 verse 10 you read these words. Colossians 4 verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. So Aristarchus was Paul's fellow prisoner. Or verse 18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. All right, so he's in prison. At that time, whilst Paul was in prison in Acts chapter 28, he didn't just write Colossians. He also wrote, it appears, Ephesians. Philippians, and the letter to Philemon. But as we found back in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul had never been to this ecclesia. He'd never been to Colossae. So how did the ecclesia start, if it wasn't started directly by Paul? Well, I think we have the answer to that question back in chapter 1, in the early verses of chapter 1. We read verses 1 and 2. That's the opening salutation of this letter. But now between verses 3 and 8 of chapter 1, the apostle commences a section where he thanks God for the existence of this ecclesia. And so you read in verse 3 of his prayer for them. Since he heard of their faith, verse 4, and their hope, verse 5, which has come to them as it has to the rest of the Roman world, verse 6. As they learned it from Epaphras, verse 7, who told the whole story to Paul, verse 8. And there's the key verse in verse 7, you see, because it would appear as though the founding member of the ecclesia at Colossae was a brother named Epaphras. You learned the truth of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who's one of you, he says. We almost know almost nothing about Epaphras. His name only appears three times in Scripture, twice in, Colossi, uh, sorry, in Colossians and once in Philemon. But the other reference to Epaphras in Colossians is very instructive. Come across to chapter 4 again. 
You read of Epaphras in chapter 4 and verse 12 of Colossians. And it tells you there, Epaphras, it says, who is one of you, that is, he's from your ecclesia, a servant of Christ saluteth you, always labouring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are of Laodicea and them in Herapolis. So evidently there were three ecclesias in close proximity. Colossae, Laodicea and Herapolis. Laodicea is about 10 miles northwest of Colossae. And Herapolis is about 10 miles further on, northwest of Laodicea. And those ecclesias straddled the Lycus River in the Lycus Valley. The Lycus was an upstream tributary of the Meander River, which made seafall at Miletus. And you might infer from these verses that Epaphras didn't just found the ecclesia at Colossae. He also started ecclesias in two adjacent cities, Laodicea and Herapolis. Because he was extremely zealous, as verse 13 says. A great zeal for you and for them and those other two ecclesias. In terms of Epaphras himself, as I said, we've got almost no information, but it's likely he came to the truth in Ephesus. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. It tells us that in Acts 20 and verse 31. Between the years 53 and 55 AD. In the school of Tyrannus, you might remember. It tells us in Acts 19 and verse 10 that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Paul, when he was at Ephesus in the mid-50s, wrote the first letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus in AD 55. And in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19, he said, the ecclesias, plural, the ecclesias of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you. So evidently by 55 AD, there were ecclesias all throughout Asia because of Paul's preaching work in Ephesus. But Paul had never been to most of those ecclesias. So clearly what happened was that people heard the truth in Ephesus and came to the truth and then took the truth inland, perhaps to places where they lived. Colossae is about 100 miles east of Ephesus inland. It was founded, it appears, along with Herapolis and Laodicea in about 55 AD. And Paul writes this letter to the Colossians five years later from prison in about 60 AD. But that's not all we know about this Colossian ecclesia. Look at verse 12. Epaphras, it says, who is one of you? Well, that, as we mentioned, tells us that Epaphras was clearly a member of this ecclesia. But he's not the only member of this ecclesia that you know. Because look at verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? So Onesimus is also a member of this ecclesia. Now, who was Onesimus? Well, you remember, he was the runaway slave of Philemon. He ran from Philemon, he fled to Rome, he went to see the Apostle Paul while he was in Rome, in prison. He came to the truth, and Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon with the epistle to Philemon. So this is not just Epaphras' ecclesia. This is Onesimus' ecclesia. This is Philemon's ecclesia at Colossae here. And in the epistle to Philemon, in verse 2, it tells us that this ecclesia met in Philemon's house. So Colossae met in the house of Philemon. I suppose you might say Philemon was the recording brother of the ecclesia at Colossae. So we really do actually know quite a bit about this ecclesia when we start putting things together. Not only that, but I'm going to show you that the character of this ecclesia in Colossae was very much the character of the man Philemon himself. Come back to chapter 1. Look at this in chapter 1, verse 3. Here's something of the character of the ecclesia at Colossae. 
We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And here it is. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. So we've heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have to all the saints, he says. Now come across with me to the epistle of Philemon. For those of you who can never find it, like me, it's just before Hebrews. And in Philemon, verse 3, the epistle of Philemon, verse 3, it says this. Grace to you, Philemon, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which there has towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Philemon, verse 5, is almost identical to Colossians 1, verse 4. Philemon, in verse 5, Paul says, I've heard of your love and faith, which you have toward, the, toward Christ and all saints. Colossians says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whoops, since we heard of your faith, rather, in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. It's almost identical. Colossians 1, verse 4, and Philemon, verse 5. So you see, the character of Philemon is stamped all over the ecclesia at Colossae. He's got a material input into the, into the character of the ecclesia that meets in his house. There's an enormous genuineness, you see, about this ecclesia, as there evidently was about Philemon himself. But for all of that, there was also an emerging problem at Colossae. You see, a dangerous error had infiltrated this ecclesia. It was a form of higher thought, a combination of Greek philosophy on the one hand and Jewish law on the other, stitched together and presented as a higher form of Christianity. It involved the worship of angels as intermediaries between God and man. It demanded a strict adherence to certain laws to the point of asceticism. Paul called it the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world. It was the truth overlaid with the thinking of the age. You read about it back in Colossians 2, but it was a major problem. And the problem was this. In a nutshell, the problem in Colossae was this. Christ was not being recognised as the head of the ecclesia like he should have been. They were shooting for a different target. They weren't shooting for the character of Jesus Christ. So he wasn't recognised as the head of the ecclesia like he should have been. And Epaphras, who had such a zeal for, the, for these ecclesias that had been founded in this area, found this problem beyond his ability to counter. And so he appealed to the only man in the world that could actually help. He appealed to the Apostle Paul himself. Well, the problem was that Paul was in prison. He couldn't come to Colossae to deal with this problem. And so Epaphras had to travel from Colossae to Rome to see Paul to ask about how to address this problem in Colossae. Now, it's easy to, easy to say that. It's easy for me to say that. It was a thousand miles from Colossae to Rome. Not an easy trip. Not a quick trip. Not a cheap trip. But you see, the truth depended upon it. And so off he went. In Colossians 1 verse 7, don't turn it up just yet, but in Colossians 1 verse 7, you remember Paul called Epaphras our dear fellow servant. And he's writing that from prison. Now you just read that and you say, well, what does it mean, our dear fellow servant? It could simply mean that a that Epaphras was a fellow labourer in the Lord's vineyard of the truth as a servant with Paul. But it appears, well, whilst that's a possible interpretation, it appears that Paul has got something far more intimate in mind than Epaphras just being another faithful brother in the truth. It appears very likely that Epaphras was a fellow servant with Paul because he'd helped Paul intimately helped the Apostle Paul in Rome, almost as if he saw that the, the care that the Apostle Paul had for all the ecclesias in the world 
And he lent a hand so that his zeal wasn't just for the ecclesias of the Lycus Valley. His zeal was for the truth and any ecclesia in the truth. Now, I say that because of what happens next. Epaphras goes to Rome. He's a dear fellow servant of the Apostle Paul. But look what it says in Philemon verse 23. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Paul's writing from prisoner, from prison. He's got a fellow prisoner. That prisoner is Epaphras. So clearly Epaphras goes to Rome to see the Apostle Paul and he's flung into prison himself. And now this is disastrous. He'd gone to Rome, you see, because Paul was in prison and Paul couldn't come to Colossae. Now he's in prison himself and he can't return to Colossae. But there's an enormous problem in Colossae, which was the very reason he went to Rome in the first place. What to do? But you see, the wheels of divine providence turn very, very slowly. Epaphras could not return to Colossae. And so the message would have to go back to Colossae another way. Colossians 4 and verse 7 tells us that Paul sends Tychicus back to Colossae with the letter to the Colossians. And you might wonder, brothers and sisters, why was that necessary? Epaphras is the one who's identified the problem. He's the one that's motivated to go and see the Apostle Paul in prison. He makes the thousand-mile journey only to find himself incarcerated with the Apostle, and another brother has to take the solution back to the Ecclesia. Why? Well, I'd make this suggestion. At the time Tychicus took the letter to the Colossians back to Colossae, Onesimus almost side by side, took back the letter to Philemon. But the letter to Philemon, you'll appreciate, was also, in many ways, a letter to Colossae because Philemon was the recording brother of Colossae. The ecclesia met in his house. And the letter to Philemon, in that letter, Paul would tell Philemon to accept Onesimus back as a brother, not as a runaway slave who'd probably stolen money from him. Now, that might have been a difficult thing for Philemon to do. You know what life's like. So God acts so that another brother, not from their ecclesia, would be the one to represent the apostles' views on other matters to that meeting. And very likely Tychicus did something that Epaphras could never do because Epaphras was one of them, too close to the situation. And so in the providence of God, another brother takes the apostles' views back to this ecclesia and Onesimus takes the apostles' views of Philemon, back to Philemon. And those two issues were divorced, you see, so that there perhaps could be some objectivity about how to deal with the major issues that were confronting the ecclesia, of which the recording brother was clearly a major part. Whatever the reason might have been, come back to Colossians 4, where did that leave Epaphras? He's in prison. The message is going back to his ecclesia without him. What does he do now? Well, Colossians 4 and verse 12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always labouring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, This phrase, labouring fervently, is the Greek word agonizomai, from which we get the English word agony. He agonised in prayer. Of course, that's all he can do. He's in prison. He's not going back to Colossae any time soon. He does what he can. And he agonises in prayer for this ecclesia. But look at the kind of man he is, this Epaphras. He didn't just pray, as you read here. He clearly prayed and provided. He did something. He put his money where his mouth was, you see. The ecclesia had a need. He travelled a thousand miles to address that need. This is a truly remarkable brother. He prays and he provides. And what was the need that Epaphras had identified in this ecclesia? Well, you've got it in verse 12 here of chapter 4, that the ecclesia might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Perfect and complete in all the will of God. And this is a major theme 
perhaps the major theme of the epistle to the Colossians. This word complete, your margin tells you it means filled. It's the Greek word pleru. It does indeed mean to make full or to have fullness. And it occurs eight times in the epistle to the Colossians. And the reason it occurs so many times is that it seems likely that the philosophers that introduced these false ideas into this ecclesia were saying that you weren't complete until you'd heard what they had to say. You weren't complete until you'd adopted their beliefs. Unless you had this special knowledge, this deeper insight. Well, of course, the facts were the opposite. A correct understanding of Jesus Christ is all you need. There is no other target. He is the head of the ecclesia, and you've got to aim to be like the head. That was the simple message to the Colossians. And so that you see, the goal of the Apostle Paul then in writing this letter to the Apostle to, to the Ecclesia was to put Christ in his proper place at the head of the Ecclesia. He's supreme. He's the only redeemer of mankind. There are no intermediaries between him and mankind. Those who come to Christ must seek to develop his character and not introduce additional requirements for salvation. Salvation, what's more, is available to all, be they Jew or Gentile, And there's no secret insight given to a select group. It's all here in this book. Everything you need to know. Now that said, there's no doubt that a knowledge of the truth is a matter of Bible study. I mean, you can't put your Bible under your pillow and let it osmotically sift into your mind. You've got to get your head into these pages. The more you study, the more you know. But the point is that anyone can do it. All the information is right here. There's no secret message anywhere else. And the apostle is at pains to explain the problem that's come upon the ecclesia. And he explains it like this. Have a look at chapter 2, verse 4. Colossians 2, verse 4. This I say, he says, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Don't be tricked, he says. Don't be tricked. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Don't let your understanding of the truth be influenced by the age in which you live. Verse 9. For in him, that is, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's our word fullness, by the way. There's another one of the eight occurrences. And you are complete. There it is again, the word fullness. You're complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. So you simply have to correctly understand the character of Jesus Christ and manifest it, the apostle says. Everything's here, right in front of you. You've just got to read your Bible carefully to unlock it. But that understanding... The understanding of the character of Christ doesn't come by magic, as I mentioned earlier. It comes by knowledge, and that takes effort. Look at chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause, Paul says, we also, since the day we heard of it, that is, the day we heard of your faith in the truth, speaking to the ecclesia, for this cause, since the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled, there's our word, filled with the knowledge of of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, there are three key words in this verse. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. And they're they're related, of course, conceptually related, but they're all different. The knowledge, knowledge is simply the acquisition of facts. Wisdom is the practical application of those facts. And understanding, or as it is here, spiritual understanding, is the boundary that your practical application operates within. You've got to see things from God's point of view. That's what spiritual understanding really means. Uh, But the purpose of that is not just to get knowledge or to be knowledgeable. The purpose is in verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord, that is of Christ, unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work. Now, what does that mean? 
that we might walk worthy of Christ unto all pleasing. Unto all pleasing of what? Unto all pleasing of whom? Well, the answer to that riddle, as I, I think is probably best explained, in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1, where the apostle says a very similar phrase. He says, in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1, We beseech you, brethren, that as you have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So evidently verse 10, what verse 10 really says is that we might walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto all pleasing of God. All pleasing of God. Just like Christ did. Christ pleased God. We know that because verses like Matthew 17 verse 5 says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And it seems as though the reason the Apostle labours that point here is that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't God's only Son in that sense. There was a man in the Garden of Eden who was also a Son of God who didn't please God. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the opposite of that. Well, the problem in Colossae, as we found from chapter 2, verse 4, was enticing words. Or chapter 2, verse 8, philosophy and vain deceit. In the Greek world, as you might be aware, when it came to finding happiness and satisfaction in life, there were two major philosophies. I mean, there were many philosophies in the Greek world, but two major philosophies that people considered when it came to finding happiness in life. They were the philosophies of the Epicureans and the Stoics. You read of them in Acts 17 and verse 18 when Paul was in Athens. The Epicureans believed that happiness was best attained by seeking pleasure. If you want to be happy, pursue pleasure. The natural consequence of that philosophy is, of course, decadence and licentiousness. On the other hand, the Stoics believed that happiness was not best achieved by seeking pleasure. It was best achieved by seeking virtue. Well, the natural consequence of that philosophy was pride and legalism. So one pursued self-indulgence, the other pursued self-control, neither pursued the character of Christ, you see. And that was a problem. That was a problem in this ecclesia. It was tending towards stoicism. It was tending towards legalism, asceticism, self-control, which is not in itself a bad thing, but it is a bad thing if it's the only thing. And they weren't pursuing the character of Christ. Let me pause for a moment and draw your attention to something which, which you probably know, but might never have asked yourself why. What you probably know is that there's a lot of parallels between Paul's letter to the Colossians and Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I mean, for example, they're like twin epistles. For example, a third of the content of Colossians appears in Ephesians. 30% of everything you read here in Colossians is duplicated in Ephesians. And the structure of the two epistles is the same. Ephesians has got six chapters. Chapter 1 to 3 of Ephesians are the doctrinal section. Chapter 4 to 6 are the practical section. In Colossians, there's four chapters. Chapter 1, 1 and 2, the first half, is the doctrinal section. Chapters 3 and 4, the second half, the practical section. So enormous duplication of material, same basic structure. Both epistles speak of the mystery or the secret of the truth. Both speak of the fullness of Christ. This key word of, of, in Colossians appears all, all the way through Ephesians as well. Both speak of knowledge. Both speak of Christ as the head of the ecclesial body. So the overlap is substantial. The question becomes then, why do we need two epistles? And by the way, both written by Paul. And by the way, both written from prison at the same time. So why then do we have Ephesians and Colossians Perhaps we could just do with one and not both. Well, the answer to that is because of the differences. And it's the differences that really explode what these two epistles are about. 
So look, at, look with me at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Christ. Look at how Christ is presented to the ecclesia at Colossae. In verse 15, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, or the firstborn of all creation. Verse 18, he's the head of the body, the ecclesia, which is, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things Christ might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all should all fullness dwell. There's our word fullness again. It pleased God that in Christ all fullness should dwell. So here's the question for you. In Colossians chapter 1, what's the emphasis? How is Christ presented in these few verses we just read? And the answer is, he's presented as the head of the ecclesial body, as the fullness of God. He's the complete manifestation of God's character. To add anything to that is to dilute it and to degrade it, and that the ecclesia should be aiming to become like the head. That's the message, isn't it? That's how Christ is presented in these verses. Well, come across with me now to Ephesians 4, by way of contrast. Now, these are twin epistles. The overlap is substantial, but so is the difference. Look at this. Ephesians 4, verse 11. God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, to the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness, our word, unto the fullness of Christ. What's the emphasis here? What's the emphasis in these verses? That the ecclesia is the body of Christ. And the body should grow up into the head and adopt the character of Christ. So what's the difference between Colossians and Ephesians? Colossians focuses on the head. Ephesians focuses on the body. So when you talk about knowledge, you see the, the tendency in Ephesus was to value carnal, worldly knowledge. They were like Epicureans in Ephesus. I mean, cast your eye down verses 17 to 20 of this chapter. The apostle exhorts themselves to restrain themselves and to leave behind their old way of life. Ephesus was degrading into licentiousness. Colossae, the opposite was true. They had a tendency to seek mystical knowledge, hidden knowledge, exclusive, not worldly knowledge, exclusive knowledge, as if Christ wasn't enough. The apostle exhorts them to stick to the truth and not add to it. The worldly licentious practices of Ephesus were not a problem in Colossae. They thought they were an ecclesia apart. It was the opposite problem. So Ephesus was in danger of the Epicurean philosophy. Colossae was in danger of the Stoic philosophy. Ephesus sought to liberalise the body, the ecclesial body. Colossi sought to legalise the ecclesial head. Neither were seeking Christ as they ought to have been, you see. So when we talk about putting Christ back in his proper place in Colossae, look how the apostle describes it. Come back to Colossians 1. Look how he describes what that means. Colossians 1 and verse 12. We give thanks to the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In the world outside, he says, the spiritual darkness, we've been called to light. Verse 13. God who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, I should just mention, it says we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. It ought to be unto or toward the kingdom of Christ's son, of God's son. The kingdom hasn't come yet. We're not in the kingdom yet. We've been translated toward the kingdom. We're heading for the kingdom. So it's not into, it might be unto the kingdom of his son. It's the Greek word aeus. Uh, into, unto, toward. Translated towards three times in one verse. 
in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12. So we're translated toward the kingdom of God's son. In whom, verse 14, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's how it happens. That's how we get into the kingdom. Verse 15, who, that is that son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And uh, I might say the language of verse 15, where's that from? Image of God, all creation. It's from Genesis 1, isn't it? It's the language of Genesis 1. And what you're reading here is that this is the new creation in Christ. The ecclesia is the new creation in Christ, as opposed to the old creation in Adam. And we leave the side of Adam at baptism, and we cleave to the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we've got to keep our eye on what we're doing, and that is on attaining the character of Christ. It's called the kingdom of God's dear son in verse 13. The margin says, the son of his love. This is the son that God delighted in, the son that Adam never was. But at this moment, even though the creation is forming, it's not done yet. It's not done yet. And there is one feature of the old creation, of the Adamic creation, that still remains in this creation, in this ecclesia, in my ecclesia. And it's the feature of free will. Men and women are called from the old creation to the new creation, but they still have free will. And therefore, all the risks of the old creation still remain. There is a risk that the new creation could fall apart like the old creation did if they didn't keep the right focus in view. And so now look again at these verses in that light. Let me show you something. Just think about the verbal links that now start to appear in Colossians. So verse 6 of chapter 1. The truth has come to you as it is into all the world and bringeth forth fruit. Well, that was a feature of the opening chapters of Genesis, fruit. The first command, in fact, of Genesis 1 and verse 28 was to go forth, be fruitful and multiply. Verse 9. For this cause also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Well, there was a knowledge of God's will in the garden. But also other knowledge crept in. Other knowledge crept in and tricked the first human pair. Verse 12, we give thanks unto the Father which has made us. Well, (laughs) If that doesn't apply to the opening chapters of Genesis, what does? They were made in the opening chapters of Genesis. Verse 12, saints in light. Verse 13, darkness needs no explanation. Light and dark were right there at the very beginning. Verse 15, the image of the invisible God. That's Genesis 1 verse 26. We're made in the image and likeness of God. And in verse 19, it says it pleased the Father. Genesis 1 verse 31 says, God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good, which literally means very pleasing. But then comes chapter 2, verse 4. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Perhaps I should read, lest any snake should beguile you with enticing words. That's Genesis 3, verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. And the same idea appears in verse 8 and in verse 18 of this chapter. Enticing words of beguilement. Verse 10 of Colossians chapter 2. But you're complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Sin entered because there was a problem with headship. Sin entered the world because there was a problem with headship. Verse 21 of Colossians chapter 2. Touch not. Oh, well, it's got Genesis 3 written all over it, don't you think? Touch not. Taste not. Handle not. Well, if they hadn't touched and tasted and handled, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. But they did touch it. And they did handle it, and they did eat it. And that unleashed a force so powerful and so irresistible that it's blighted man's creation for the subsequent 6,000 years. 
And the consequence of that is Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. You're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. The first reaction in Genesis 3, verse 8, was that they hid themselves. And why were they hiding? Verse 5, mortify therefore the members which are upon the earth, fornication, unclean, that's why they hid. They were ashamed. They covered themselves. They were ashamed. And what was the consequence? Verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. And it did, didn't it? The wrath of God deliberately and directly came upon Adam and Eve because of disobedience. And when they were questioned, what happened? When the interrogation began in Genesis 3, what happened? Verse 9. Lie not. One to another. Oh, the woman made me do it. Oh, the snake made Don't lie to me. Remarkable. What was the solution? Verse 10. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created. And they put on skins and were forgiven. They clothed themselves. And where did the problem begin? Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. Remarkable, isn't it? Just one verse after another. Verbal links of the story in Genesis and of the collapse of the old creation. And this ecclesia is being told, I've taken you out of that darkness. I've created you as a new creation. Don't be sullied by the very beguiling influences which destroyed the old creation. So much could have been and so much was lost. This is the solution. Don't mess up the solution. Don't let the new creation go the same way as the old. We've got the complete solution in Christ, he says. Don't change it. This creation, this creation of the 21st century, is part of the old kingdom. The kingdom of darkness, not part of the kingdom to come. It doesn't really matter whether it's Gentile liberalism or Jewish legalism, these are the philosophies of the age which are incompatible with the character of Christ and certainly incompatible with the kingdom that we've been translated towards. Well, it was the year A.D. 60. This letter had been written, as we said, dispatched to the ecclesia at Colossae by the hand of Tychicus, Later that year, AD 60, there was an earthquake in that region that completely destroyed all the cities of the Lycus Valley. Laodicea rebuilt itself. In fact, so powerful was Laodicea that it even refused a grant from the emperor. We're rich, we're increased with goods, we have need of nothing, they said. They literally said that. And they funded their own rebuilding campaign. And Laodicea was rebuilt after the earthquake. Herapolis did take the grant from the, from the emperor. And Herapolis was rebuilt. Colossae tried to rebuild. But it was off the trade route. Colossae was never the same again. Today there are no ruins at Colossae. There are ruins at Herapolis. There are big ruins at Laodicea. There are no ruins at Colossae. The kingdom of Colossae, as it was in this century, is completely gone. But the house of Philemon was different, wasn't it? The house of Philemon was different. The ecclesia that met in his house was very different. They no longer depended on earthly kingdoms. They had been translated toward the kingdom of God's dear son, in whom they had redemption through his blood, the emblems of which are on the table before us. They will live again. They will live again, even though Colossae never would. And so will we, brothers and sisters. Men were not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. God manifestation, not human salvation, was the great purpose of the eternal spirit. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.